Good morning. I'm glad that you're here. I'm happy to be here. Although, just to be very honest, um, I wish I didn't have to talk about what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give part three of this series, There Are No Words. And today we're going to focus on what do we do when facing tragedy. But to be honest, after this week, my prayer has been, Lord, I pray for the time when I don't have to give sermons like this anymore. This series started as a response to the Orlando shooting, and it took me a couple of weeks just to even hear from God what he wanted to say. I struggled with finding words to articulate my sorrow and my grief and, and what the Lord would have us do. And so in that delay, the period of time that we um, have devoted to this sermon series, during that time there's been so many other tragedies that make this series even more necessary to be heard. And I hate that. I, I pray for the time where I don't have to talk about this anymore. Where we won't shoot each other and hurt each other. We're going to talk today because we need to. We're going to talk about it today because we have to, but not because we want to. Amen? So there are no words. We're, we're discussing what do we do in the midst of unspeakable tragedy, unspeakable sorrow, when words cannot even articulate what's wrong. And like I said, this is part three. What we've covered before is um, when processing tragedy and loss, we should keep God in the center, grounding our thoughts in faith, hope, and love so we can receive his comfort. And then in part two, we covered God is good. If we see him clearly, he can be our source of comfort when facing tragedy. It was... In the first session that we talked about the normal, typical human response to unspeakable tragedy, it's disillusionment, it's numbness, it's anger, it's fear, and that's the typical response. And what we talked about was those things are not grounded in God, and if we want to receive comfort, we have to shift and ground our thoughts and our actions in things that are inherent in the character of God, part of who God is, if we want to feel better in any way, if we want to make progress in our lives in any way. And that presupposes that we understand who God is, that we see God as a God of love and mercy and compassion. And unfortunately, that is not a given. Many people believe God is vindictive and angry and distant and cold, and that's just not who he is. And so when we envision a God that is like that, it's impossible to get comfort because you can't even trust God. But I worship a God who is trustworthy, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who is love who is peace, who is kindness and goodness and every other good thing you can imagine. He is it and all of that stems from him. The only reason that we have any concept of love is because it flows from him like a river. That's who our God is. Now, why does all this matter? We're going to talk about actions today. And if you have a perspective that is grounded in anger, powerlessness, fear, revenge, outrage, hopelessness, and depression, if those are your thoughts, if that is where you're coming from, I would say that that is going to influence and color your actions. Now, if you ground your mind in faith, hope, and love, 
you're going to have a different set of actions. What, in your words, what are the difference between these two ways of thinking? Um, the actions that come out, what, what is, what's the difference? Go ahead. For me, um, when I think of anger and powerlessness and everything on that side, I think of just like, you don't think about what you're going to do, you do it based on emotion. Mm. And when I think about faith, hope, and love, I, in my opinion, you think about what you're going to do and you think about the other person first. Yes. How it's going to affect them, or how they're going to, it's going to hurt them, or whatever that outcome might be. Yes. Based on that versus just quick emotion. Amen. Amen. What else? What else? On the left side, I see sadness and injustice. Mm -hmm. On the right side, I know there's a right thing. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Go ahead, Sonia. In my life, I'm subject. I'm seeing a lot of revenge, anger, because I'm homeless, because I go to the city. Mm -hmm. it, it is prevalent, the anger and the way people treat each other and the deaths and the drugs. It is impossible to not feel that in my situation. Mm. And it is ugly mm. and it's scary. Yes. And I spend a lot of time praying just to keep myself covered away from the negative around mm -hmm. me. It's mm -hmm. very, very sad. Yeah. It's very hard to live with. Yeah. So I definitely hope, faith, and love is where I come from. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's very scary. Right. Right. So I'm going to say something. This is not something I could back up so strongly with the Bible. So take or leave what I'm about to say. I'm just going to tell you the way I, I think about things. The Bible does say that the kingdom of God is at hand, that the eternal life with God we can experience now. In fact, that was the focus of Jesus's ministry. And what he wanted us to know is that we can experience the kingdom now. And I think similarly, now, this is the part that there's not a ton of Bible to support. It's just what I, this is my opinion. Amen? So just take it for that. But I believe that similarly, people can experience a little bit of hell in this life too. And hell is separation from all those things that God is. A place where there is no peace, where there is no love, where there is no mercy. And I believe that when we root our thoughts in things that are not of God, what can only flow are actions that are not of God. Amen? And actions that are not of God create situations and, 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 and um, incidents that are not of God. You follow what I'm saying? And, and that creates a pocket <laughs> of life that is more resembling hell than heaven. And, and people who have seen true, truly depraved situations, people who experience true evil, I think would attest to what I'm saying, that you feel it. And, and the, the danger is why this matters is because these tragic situations create such strong emotions and such strong feelings that people often act, just like Nani was saying, without really processing what they're doing or saying or thinking and create more damage, create more harm. And we cannot, as the people of God, allow that to be true of the church. The church universal, the church individual. We cannot allow ourselves to get caught up in that. We are supposed to be the salt and light. We are supposed to be the healing balm. Now that doesn't mean we're, we're mousy and quiet and timid. No, we stand up for justice. We stand up for what's right. Jesus did a whole lot of that in his ministry. But he always did it motivated by love. By concern for all involved. Amen? God says something about what he intends for his people to be. 
in situations that are difficult. And this is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. What is the key word in that passage? Christ. But what is the the action? Comfort. Yeah, it's the word repeated more than any other. Comfort, 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 comfort. So that may mean that Paul wants us to pay attention to that word (laughs) and what it's saying. And what he's talking about is that they experience all kinds of things, all trouble. And I think lately we can say we've been experiencing all kinds of trouble. Amen, church? We can relate to what Paul is talking about. We've been experiencing some trouble. And he says the purpose of that trouble or the result of that trouble is that God provides us with comfort and that he does that so that when other people are going through all kinds of trouble we can comfort them as well so the key to I believe having right actions in the face of tragedy is wrapped up in this passage about receiving and providing comfort so we're going to dig a little bit deeper But before we do that, there's a key point that I want to mention. When we think about tragedies, when we think about getting through, how do we move on in the face of this terrible tragedy? It's not understanding that does it. It's comfort. It's being at peace with it. I'm going to talk about what that means in just a second. But I know for me, Sometimes I rack my brain trying to understand why certain things happen. Anyone else like that? And I'm going to break the bad news to you right now. God never promised us full understanding for why things happen. Nowhere. And in fact... Many of us are going to go to our eternal rest not knowing why certain things happen. But what God does say, He will provide us with comfort in all our trouble. I think about Stephen, who was our, the first Christian martyr. I'm sure Stephen was praying, Lord, get me out of this. I I don't want to die. And as the trial was going on, things were looking worse and worse for Stephen. And I'm sure he doesn't have all the answers, or he died not having all the answers about why that was happening to him. But we know from the testimony of his own mouth that he died with comfort. He said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And you know what? I may not have all the answers, but that is good enough for me. Just to see his face, just to know that he's there, just to know he's with me is enough. To know that he's good and to know that he's still on his throne and that he's still in control. And although bad things are happening, now he will make them good. That is good enough for me. So I'm sorry, you're not going to have all the answers to your questions. You're not going to know all the whys in this life. That's where trusting God comes in. We we trust God because he has all the answers. And and say, God, you haven't revealed that to me. I don't understand it now. But I trust you that you're working out something in my life and in the lives of everyone else involved. And the second thing that I want to pull out from this passage is that 
Comfort is not something that we hold on to. It's meant to be shared. You know, it happened to me so many times that I'm praying about a situation and I'm broken up about it before I hit my knees and then I hit my knees and God speaks something to me that just heals me. It doesn't answer my questions, but it heals me. Amen? And what this passage is saying is that, you know what, what God just gave to you, you should also freely give to others so they too can be comforted. Amen? So let's talk about that. But first, what blew my mind about this passage, because I wanted to really get into it, as we already said that this word comfort is a word that appears a lot and is emphasized here by Paul. And so I wanted to know what this word comfort meant, because I believe that's the key to figuring out what our actions should be moving forward, understanding this word comfort. And I was just blown away with how powerful this word is. This word is not just woo, 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 there, 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 you're fine. It's a deep, deep, powerful word. And let's talk about that. The word that is translated comfort comes from the Greek word paraklesis. And this word means comfort, consolation, exhortation, entreaty. And what you, you see under here are more specific definitions or, or more nuanced definitions for this word. What it means, the literal meaning is to call near in order to help. Right? So it, it has this connotation of saying, hey, I see you're suffering. Come here. Let me help you. Come. Come to me. I will help you. It also has a definition of importation, supplication, entreaty. And it is also a word for persuasive discourse. So that's advocacy, that's standing up for the one who is afflicted. And the last definition is encouragement, exhortation, and admonition. How do we move forward? What do we need to do next? Now this is a powerful action-oriented definition. This is a powerful action-oriented word. And it's even bigger than you and I might think. Know why? Ask me why. Why? Because this is the title that Jesus gave to the Holy Spirit. The comforter. The advocate. And Jesus gave the same title to himself because he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, another one of the same kind. I am your advocate, and I'm going to pray the Lord when I leave for him to send another one, like me, to help you and be with you forever. So the whole act of comfort is the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's so much so his work that that is how Jesus identified him to us and revealed him to us. So when we provide comfort, we are actually participating in the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit. That is what he does to the extent to which that is what he is. He is comfort. It's not such a soft word now, is it? It's a powerful word. So what does that mean for us? Comfort in action. So what I did was I took the definitions and jumped off from there into what we should do. Now this is all by the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. We're participating in that. And I'm going to give something away. I was going to say this later, but I'm going to say it now because it's important. Comfort, God's way of providing comfort, brings us into close proximity to the victims. It does so with the victims firmly in mind. 
that other list, you know those people side by side, the anger, the, the, the vengeance, all that, the victim is forgotten. And it becomes very self-focused. This is how I feel. I'm angry, so I want to act out my anger. But comfort brings us into close proximity to the victim. Part of that is we don't ask for things that the victim does not want. Amen? Oh, boy, when, when tragedies get politicized, it takes on a whole other life, and the, the voice of the victim is lost. Comfort doesn't do that. It brings us in close proximity with the victim. So the first definition, call near in order to help. Another way to think about that is sympathy. What we say is that I feel your pain. I suffer with you. Right? The word compassion means, or, or passion means to suffer. Compassion means to suffer with. Right? So we suffer with you in this. And ways of addressing that are sending a card, call someone, crying with them. Right? The, the, the right response to all of these is prayer. All these have to be done in prayer. And that's what I meant by by the power of the Holy Spirit. Nothing can be separated from prayer. But these are just some examples of things that could fall into that category of sympathy. The next definition, importation, supplication, entreaty, persuasive discourse. This is advocacy. And in some translations of the Bible, the passages that I read before um, from John, um, another comforter, another advocate, different Bibles say the same thing. So this word Comfort can also be translated advocate in some translations. And so this word advocacy says, I will work to stop the cause of your pain. I will stand up for you. In fact, in some cases, cases if you can't stand for yourself, I will stand up in your place to make sure this doesn't happen to anybody else. And there are things that we could do there. We can call or write Congress. We can vote. But going out to the polls and making your voice heard is a great way to stand up um, for, for victims and to speak up in our conversations with others, share a different perspective, share a different way of thinking of things in love, not arguments, but sharing the love of God with others. And the last one, encouragement, exhortation, ad, ad, admonition. We can also refer to that as support. In other words, I will help you move forward. Exhortation is, I'm going to tell you the things that you need to do to help you move forward, right? So what we could do is send encouraging words, financial support, and live and share the gospel. Victims need to know that this is not all that there is, that Jesus has made all things well. He will wipe away every tear, and, and, and there will be no more pain or sadness or crying or death because Jesus has made all things well. People need to hear that hope. They need to hear that good news. So not all of us will do the same things. Amen? Not all of us are built to do the same thing. But what I want to encourage us to do is to think individually and collectively about what God is saying to us about the work of the Holy Spirit and how we can participate in that in some way. And I'll tell you, church, when we start not just holding on to the comfort, but giving away, we feel better. We feel more hopeful. We don't feel like the world is so dark and that there's no solutions out there because we are part of the solution. We are part of the work of trying to correct this. I think that a lot of the problems that we're seeing, especially in the past week, the division in our country, the anger, I honestly believe that the church is the only institution that could fix it. Not government, not cities, not states, the church. 
because only the gospel message, it is only the gospel message that could change hearts and minds and, and increase one's capacity for love. And that's what's needed. So if the church has no voice, if the church says nothing, if the church does nothing, how can love increase in our nation? If God is love and the only source of it, how can we love each other more if the church doesn't do good work? Amen? And I would like to, for us to discuss as a congregation what God is saying for us to do. James had a lot to say about this. He said, you know what? If you have bread and, and your neighbor comes to you and asks for bread and, and then you say, you know what? Peace be filled. Let me pray for you, brother. Go on, you know. And you don't give him bread. What good is your faith? Keep your prayer to yourself and give them some bread. And we need to figure out what is the bread that we can give to our community to help them heal, to help them move forward. Amen? In conclusion, we should act when tragedy strikes, but we should do so in a way that allows God to provide comfort in and through us. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful to you that you speak to us, Lord, and that we're not all alone in figuring out what to do in the midst of tragedy, Lord. Thank you that we can call on you and you are rock solid, Lord God. We can hold on to you and you promise to comfort us, Lord God. We may not understand but we will be comforted, and we find comfort in you. And Lord, bless us to be a comfort to others. Guide our actions so they are grounded and rooted in you, Lord God. And let us be a, a force of good that shows that there is a God who loves us, who does not want us killing each other, who mourns over every death, and will one day make all things right again. We thank you so much and we give you the glory, Lord, in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.